welcome. I'm here again with Elizabeth Gould. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. Good to be here. We start, well, we ended last time we were talking about um, archetypes and how we can bring them in our lives and everything. And we we kind of, we realised that we could just go off down some rabbit hole and and keep talking about things and life in general. And we've just spent, I kid you not, nearly half an hour (laughs) talking about societal maturity and personal maturity and responsibility and everything. So we're off down some rabbit holes this morning. (laughs) Here we go. (laughs) So let's start talking. One of the things that you said after we finished talking last time, we were talking about listening. And listening is actually a skill that isn't necessarily taught, is it? It's not. And it's such an important skill to know how to listen, not only to each other, but to what's going on in the world around us. I think it's kind of a hidden superpower if you know how to cultivate it. (laughs) You can get a lot of information by listening, too. Yeah, just I remember talking to somebody a few years ago and he commented that he's one of those people that will walk into the room and within 20 seconds he can figure out who is kingpin and he goes across and talks to them he's and he said i'm not one of those people who stands at the back of the room and observes and i said well i am one of those people who stands at the back of the room and observes because i'm watching everything that's going on in that room I'm figuring out where everybody fits in. I'm not just ignoring the whole thing and walking to the middle. So there's two completely different sides, aren't there? Absolutely. And I think it's all sort of reading reading energies, which we're not taught in school, but is inherent in us. We can kind of feel things and sense things, but we all have a different approach. One, you know, one guy's like, I want to go towards action. And somebody else may be like, oh, I want to kind of hold the whole picture or be somewhere in between in the middle of the crowd. So. There's so many ways to do this thing. So tell me what listening is for you. What is listening? Well, it's first of all, shutting my mouth for a moment (laughs) and uh, getting into my body. So fully inhabiting my body. So I'm aware of the sensations going on and, and being present being as completely present as I can, which these days in age is a tall order because there's so many distractions in the world. There's always something, whether it's on our screen or in our environment. So uh, just being still and fully inhabiting our bodies and being in the present moment, easier said than done. Mm. That's that's what listening is to me. So in terms of listening... What does so as somebody on the receiving end of listening, because I know and where I'm kind of going with this is I know when I meet somebody and we're talking and I'm trying to tell them something and then they cut me off halfway through the sentence. That never feels good. I I think every human being has a, a basic need and desire to be heard, to be understood, to be loved. And and when we give our attention 100% to someone and are able to listen and receive what they're trying to say, that's like the greatest thing. That's so deeply satisfying. Do, do you notice that when someone listens to you truly and doesn't cut you off, how that makes you feel compared to someone who's, who's like, oh, yeah, I know that. And then they go running on to their own story. It's really a big thing. Um, and and kind of at, at the core of, of our human feeling life, I would say. It, I hadn't thought of it from that perspective. For me, when I want to listen to somebody, and I've, I've done a, a, a fair bit of training in personal development and in being with people and just shutting up and letting people talk, <laughs> but it is an acquired skill. And the hardest thing was to just stop my mind because as human beings, when the other person's talking, we're going, oh, how can I answer that? And off we go on a little tangent. So, and then, and I I do do this. I am nowhere close to perfect. I go, oh, and I have an idea and I want to talk about it right now. It's so difficult not to do that, isn't it? 
it is difficult because we want to have connection. So sometimes doing that means, oh yeah, I know that feeling or I've experienced that. Or one thing that I know is wanting to advise someone else, which, you know, let's get real. People generally don't want advice or if they do, they'll ask for it. But how easy it is um, that to want to advise or instruct and it's not always welcome. <laughs> or fix. <laughs> or fix. Exactly. Because, and it comes from a good space. You know, we want to make the person feel better. And I know it's it's definitely a male thing. And I'm this I'm backed up by psychologists here, but men just want to make things better. They see a problem, they want to fix it. But women need to talk and be heard. There's a whole different scenario there. That's right. It's and it's sometimes it's amazing men and women together, cats and dogs, you know. How do these things come together? But there's a beauty when there is that um, able to give and receive and and build on each other's strengths and incorporate each other's strengths. That's the ultimate goal, I think. Yeah, I agree. But that listening, because I just wonder how many issues are caused by people not being heard. Ooh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. There may be something in there. Yeah, I know because, you know, quite often all, and I say to my kids, if you hear somebody saying the same thing over and over again, you haven't heard what it is they're trying to say. And they might not be able to communicate it, but you've got to, that's your job. If they're saying the same thing over and over to you, you're missing something. They've not been heard. Interesting. Wow. Because it, it's interesting because I do this when I'm doing the podcast and I'm talking to you. My job is to clear a space emotionally and in my mind for you to talk into and you feed into the, it gives you the space to say whatever comes up, be whoever you feel like being without any judgment or anything from me. That's That's important. But if we all did that, well, because we're human, we're in we're in dialogue. It's it's healthy to share information and uh, and yeah, ultimately to give each other the space. So, I mean, I would see it that I, I thank you for having this opportunity to be able to share what I want. But I also I want to hear your experience. I want to know because that then that strengthens the connection between us and. Our audience, it's its something about um, giving and receiving that that I, I value. You know, we, we help each other. But we're back to what we were talking about, making the world a more mature um, and respectful place that, 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 that feels like an integral part of it, being able to give and receive in equal measure. It does, doesn't it? Because we were talking before we came online about I asked you whether there is societies have different levels of maturity because I look at some behaviors in certainly in western societies and I just go <laughs> it's like a toddler having a tantrum <laughs> there is nothing mature about what you're doing right now <laughs> Talk to me about that because we did have a great conversation about that and I would love to discuss that a bit more. Okay, let's see. Uh, yes, well, just as an individual goes through different stages of life and, and part of what you're doing with your podcast of looking at the different stages of a woman's experience and what I'm doing with my book The Well of Truth is showing a woman develop through uh, her life and developing maturity that she receives from each experience she has in the same way our our cultures are are doing that hopefully as well and and you know we being American and living in New Zealand, um, they're both relatively young cultures, as is the Australian culture. And so um, it's interesting to see how these, how countries or 
you could even say businesses, the different entities go through a process of becoming, of maturing. And uh, this is this is all part of that. But when it's more difficult if we don't see it happening on the outside in a, in a very clear way. It can be harder to embody that. You know, what does, I mean, I often l- look one step down the road, like where I'm going to next as far as my personal growth and and I, I think, who can I who can I look to who's who is a, an older woman who is um, living these things that I value do you find you do that I do yeah I'm, I think I mentioned this last time I'm a real Trekkie I love Star Trek <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just watching Star Trek Picard Uh, with an older Captain Jean-Luc Picard. You know, he's in his late 70s, early 80s now. And just his maturity, and he went through a period of feeling weak, as we all do. And now he's come out of it and people, he and the people around him are acknowledging his experience and his wisdom. And I think that's so important because, what I see a lot isn't an, uh, isn't maturity, and I don't see it as a kind of behaviour that I want to emulate. And I'm it concerns me because it's on a societal level. You know, Keely, my daughter, when she was oh, what year? she was in, I think she was fifteen or sixteen, did an exchange for three months to Colombia with this girl in Colombia, and she came back and she said. It is so dull in Australia compared to Colombia. She said, everybody in Colombia has got a lot of life. It's very entrepreneurial. It's very um, exciting and there's a lot of energy. She said, you come to Australia and it's just chill. (laughs) There is nothing happening. And I can see that, you know, but at the same time, like you say, there's not a maturity about our culture as a whole, you know, we're young countries. Right. Um, if you're you're interested, there's um, there's a man named Michael Mead, who's an uh, American storyteller, who uh, a psychologist among many things, and he he tells stories that are really about the maturing of man of humanity, um, and and he, he has different podcasts and things, but it, it's, it's really, he gives a really interesting spin on how these old tales kind of inform this process that we're in. Um, and there's also someone uh, by the name of Stephen Jenkinson. He's a Canadian man who's written a lot about um, death and grief and end of life subjects. And he talks a lot about the difference between being an older and an elder that, being older is just someone who's got older but hasn't taken on the mantle of being a wise person, uh, you know, a village elder who who is able to hold the younger people to be able to be a role model and, a, you know, a real pillar of the society. And I, I thought that was a very interesting distinction that he made. It is, isn't it? Because when you put that into the context of what we were just talking about, the maturity of a society, our society doesn't value elders, doesn't value olders, but that's what you get left with is an older rather than an elder. That's right. Yeah. And looks like that's going to be on us to say, okay, you gave us a challenge. We're we're going to continue this. If we want to see it, we have to be it. So how would you be it? How how what would you do? Hmm. Well, one thing that feels important is having a, a multi generational connection and and having children like we both do and uh, and being connected with their circles. That I know it helps me grow because I'm learning more about what what it is for my kids to be growing up and the, their concerns and. And their world, but it it seems to me that um, more than trying to fix or advise younger people, for instance, it's to listen to them, 
to listen to what their concerns and fears are, um, the, the things that they're trying to cope with, because the list is long. And I, I also know that there's many young people who are upset with our generation and above because, you know, we, we had the good times. We weren't thinking in long term about what was coming down the track and they have to deal with it. And so there's, there's not much I can do about that, but I can be present to them. I can hold them and understand them and listen that's a really great point because, you know, I'm sitting here criticising society for being a teenager, you know, throwing a tantrum, slamming the doors and everything, whereas in actual fact, our generation when it was younger, we were like the two-year-old who goes over to the Christmas tree and one by one breaks all the baubles till there's none left and then has a tantrum about that. So I cannot point the finger. <laughs> society, you know, get off my high horse. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the mystery of life is like I was once that and and from this vantage point that we're at now to to see that and to be able to recognize ourselves in that and also to kind of hold a lantern out and say there's something called maturity and, and that's what we're stepping into next and we may not always get it right but we have this vision of of being connected building community, being stepping into the wisdom years. That's what this is for us now. And But it's on each of us to find the way forward. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because like if you look at our society, if we were the toddlers, you know, smashing everything and breaking everything until it had all gone, which is and you, that I find so frustrating about people now, but because it's, our generation's not necessarily learning. I'm not talking about the younger generation here because half of them have got a solid head on their shoulders and there's a few of them who, you know, like everybody matures at different rates. But our generation, some people are still just going around smashing all those baubles. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think of it sometimes at... We went to school and then when we got out of school and went on to careers or adult life, people felt like, well, I don't have to learn anymore. I've learned everything I need to know. And, and I think it's on each of us to continue our, our studies of ourselves and with what's happening in society, these massive changes. And if we want, if we want to be part of the change, and we better, we better educate ourselves constantly. And so um, if the, it seems to me that people that don't want to do that, they don't want to keep doing their homework, well, then they're holding us back. Don't you think? Uh, look, I totally agree. It's, it's one of the, the bugbears of any kind of personal development. It's you, you have a big breakthrough and then 10 years later you're having a meltdown about something. You go, hang on, I got rid of you 10 years ago. What are you doing coming back again? Because it never goes away. We, you can't, there's no end point in this. There's just constant learning and it is constant learning and constant growth. And the worst thing is you're never going to get there. <laughs> exactly. And there's, there's an endless array of things to learn about. And I think that's what keeps us human. That's, that's what keeps us, um, at least for me, keeps me going, gets me to wake up the next day to embrace life is, is knowing that I know, I know less and less as time goes on, but that there, there are so many different ways to engage in this huge mystery. And as long as I have that willingness to do that, then I'm going to have that oomph to get up and to play the game, to be part of this thing. And the day that I that I don't want to learn anymore, I shut myself down. Well, that's not going to be a very good day. That's really interesting. This is one of the topics that I was talking to AJ, the lawyer, about the other week, because people want to feel safe. And the more I learn, the less I know is how it feels to me. Like the more I learn, the more I realize that there's so much I don't know. Yeah. And, and in a way, that's kind of an exciting thing. Because well, 
it kind of is like you and I look on it as exciting, but a lot of people want things to be safe and predictable. And when you realize you don't know something, you're not safe. True. True. And and, and not to say that there aren't days where I wake up and I'm like, I don't, I really don't know anything. And it's, it feels destabilizing. And, I, and it's like, oh my God, what's going on? Uh, I think we all feel that because every day we're learning, we're having to challenge our assumptions about the, the ways we were educated or the world we grew up in. But the, the truth of the matter is, is that there's only one thing that's constant. The moment you're born, there's only one way you're headed and everything is about change. Like life is about change. Like there's a couple chapters in the book, uh, The Well of Truth, where, you know, the character is just having to confront that again, like either I'm going to like put a barricade up and keep myself out of the world or else I'm going to embrace it and get a surfboard and learn to like ride the waves and I'll get much, I'll enjoy or I'll, I'll, experience life in a fuller way if I if I recognize that and 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 that's really kind of the gauntlet for all of us is how can we how can we stay flexible and fluid in the face of the onslaught of change that is our lives yeah and there's two places I want to go with this because one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was that's why we can't offer advice to younger people because we don't understand what they're going through because their circumstances are completely different and and the pressures they've got in their lives we have never experienced so all we can do is offer i suppose guidelines for uh, how to respond who to be so it's more about on an emotional spiritual level than it is on an action level cuz we don't know what they're doing <laughs> yeah Exactly. And, you know, I felt as a as a mom that I had these years to help them develop the tools that were in their toolbox for life. But at a certain point, they, they're carrying their toolbox. And if I didn't put something in, I can't be like, oh, oh we don't, here, here's the monkey wrench. <laughs> I can't, but I can at any stage uh, be there to support them as they learn their tools or we can we can learn new tools together or what have you but i think you're you're absolutely right that we don't know it's the what they're holding and so um it's it's arrogant to think that i can tell them what they need to do or how to handle something and and, and if you look at it from that regard then the biggest gift we can give to somebody is that it's okay to be uncertain. There's going to be no certainty. So how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it? And that's where, you know, talking about role models and archetypes, that's when that comes in, isn't it? It is. And also community. That as a little individual blowing in the wind, it's very destabilizing. But if you feel somehow that you're held, even by one person who can see you and be a home for you. Wow. That makes all the difference, I think. Yeah, and being heard as well, you know. So those those few things all kind of tie together is that they've got to be heard. Your issue has to be heard. And then we can talk about being. Yes. From which actions come out of that. I That's suppose. right. And alongside of that, one thing that I have that I feel strongly about is um, that we everyone needs to be heard without being fixed or changed, but also acknowledge the feelings that come up. And and it seems to me that grief is something that's just kind of like kind of skirting around in the shadows. And sometimes you just got to like say, okay, come sit with me at the table and have a cup of tea. And, and I just need to be present with you. And then what happens, whatever emotion it is, you have your cup of tea and at a certain point they leave. They may spend a couple of days or they may spend a, you know, you don't know how long they'll stay. But I, I think it's important that we also are present with and listen to whatever 
is showing up, don't you think? Totally, totally, because we're we're okay being with happy emotions. We're even okay dealing with anger and upset. We are not okay in dealing with grief. <laughs> when somebody's grieving, we tend to say, oh, do you want a moment? And we'll give them, we'll leave them alone like, what on earth? That's when they most need somebody just standing there not saying anything, but just giving them the space to process and grieve. Right. And once again, it comes back to that, what we started with talking about the importance of listening, being present with, holding a container, whether you call it community or, or what have you, that, that we do this for each other. And that's the greatest thing we can do. Holding the space for somebody's grief, though, is quite difficult because we've got, we're going to experience at some level that emotion. We've got to get that emotion. How do we, how do you deal with that? Could you rephrase that question? Just so, like, if, if I'm just thinking, a friend of mine, her husband died just recently and her son died about 10 years ago as well. And it just, I I think because I'm quite empathetic, you know, when I I'm with her grief, I just don't even want to go towards how she feels. So I because I feel it on a physical level and an emotional level, not obvious obviously not to the extent that she is. I'm not saying that, but I it's painful to be with her pain and not be able to do anything about it oh actually I hadn't thought of that maybe that's the thing maybe grief is difficult because we can't fix it I think yeah I think that's one of the things when we see someone else's pain and we want to take it away from them because we love them yeah and we absolutely can't that is hard so the difficult thing in that situation is just being able to be with that pain because we don't want to. We don't want pain. <laughs> we just want it to go away. Right. And that's um, that's one of the characteristics of our adolescent culture is that <laughs> we there, push it away. And if we, as we were talking about early, if, earlier, as, as we move into these elder positions, that that's one of the skills that we uh, behooves us to cultivate is that ability to just sit with it, not fix it. Yeah. Just to, to feel heart to heart connection without having to make it better. Mm. I always struggled with what to say. Like when my friend's son died, <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So I just kept taking food around because <laughs> I didn't know what to do to make it any better, you know. I didn't know what to say. What am I supposed to say? How are you? I know how she is. She feels terrible. And like now 10, 12 years on and her husband's just died, I, I, I still don't know what to say. And I, 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 I'm a fix it. I'm a fixer. You know, I can't help myself. Got to fix it. Got to make it better. But all I just keep sending her emails, just thinking of you hope you're going okay if there's anything I can do or if you want to talk to me that's because I just don't know what to say (laughs) you're following your instincts and food things like that when when you're grieving sometimes it can be really hard to feed yourself uh, you know the very basics that and just knowing that there's someone there who's on call that you need something I can get it for you that's immensely um, comforting to know that someone is has you in their consciousness when you're going through a hard time because it's so easy to just and I think quite possibly our culture tends to do this somebody's grieving and this is a generalization and I'm just I'm kind of picturing this as I'm going on you know, we give them a couple of weeks, you know, they're going to be sad for a couple of weeks, and then we expect them to be better. Yeah, it's not, it's not linear or logical like that. And, and often, some people, in my experience, they'll, they'll, they'll manage to make it through the shock phase and seem like they're coping pretty well. But three years down the road, 
it lands in them and they're, and they're really kind of, um, you know, sucker punched by the loss. And so grief is so mysterious. It, it just has its own landscape. It has its own language. It's such a, it's such a different thing. And, it, it, and if you're not in the middle of it, you can, you know, you can kind of help support, but that's, you're, you're, you're an outsider of, of that world. And it is hard to know what to say or to do. And grief isn't, I remember a long time ago, I read this book called the grief recovery handbook. And it was really great because it said, we think of grief as when somebody dies, but in actual fact, we grieve over all sorts of situations. You know, we might grieve because we thought somebody was a certain person and they're not. And there's disappointment there, but there's also grief because we're giving up an idea of what could have been. There's grief in divorce. There's grief in death. There's all these grief. There might even be grieving because you're moving out of a house that you've loved and you've lived in it 40 years. Exactly. And 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 that there's it's so deeply woven into our experience. It's a matter of do we acknowledge it? Uh, and, and are we able to recognize it? And that's where rituals, um, just little daily, um, ceremonies or rituals that we can have in our lives to help us physically and emotionally move through our feelings or our, um, grief. Like, okay, this, this, scenario has ended or this relationship or this time in my life and and acknowledging it symbolically is is very very helpful and i you know i think a lot about this experience that we've been on and continue to be on collectively with um this pandemic and and you know i have this fantasy of what if every town city had some ritual acknowledgement of not only the people that have died but the people whose have, lives have changed forever because of it for many different reasons uh for for just all of the changes that came with it and i i imagine what if we had sort of these built these labyrinths that people could walk through and and just acknowledge all of the the sadness that we have from the changes that that we've all been through and, and then all the things that have been revealed along the way that um, you know we're holding I, I feel like that's an important thing I hadn't thought of that because it's like the cenotaphs isn't it for the for the fallen soldiers it's the same kind of thing somewhere to go to recognize and acknowledge because We've also got to acknowledge the fact that we did survive and we are okay and things might not be the same, but there's different opportunities that we didn't expect to have. Yeah. So in in a way, since we're talking about um, maturing, that it this pandemic, for whatever to be said, it is a rite of passage for our civilization. It really is. And whether we step through it meeting the challenge and and can have a deeper maturity that's yet to be seen but if we can attend to all of those things that go along with developing maturity like being kind um, forming community uh, feeling our personal and collective grief if as we put all those things together then there's a better chance that we'll come out more mature, but if we're just railing against the machine and smashing the uh, ornaments on the Christmas tree and and driving crazier and flipping people off, well, that may not be. That may not be such a good thing. <laughs> not necessarily constructive behavior, <laughs> right? Right. In terms of societies or us individually, as an archetype, what would you bring into this kind of situation? <laughs> well, it seems to me like it's really the archetype of the wise woman who's being asked to step in here, who's saying, hey, let's bring it all back home. 
let's let's take care of each other let's take care of this earth let's let's not get lost in all the distractions come sit by the fire with me and i'm and, and we're going to we're going to dream in this new way that's inclusive that's loving that's nurturing that's supportive of all life that's what i'm going to that's what i'm putting my my ticket on <laughs> Yeah, no, that's good because it's, it, it encompasses all of those things we were talking about, being heard and being okay with what is. And I think that's the issue that, you know, where that fear feeling of fear and not being safe comes from, we're not okay with what is. We want it to look a certain way. It doesn't look that way. And we're desperate to try and make it look that way again so we don't feel safe as opposed to going, okay, well, this is, this is what it looks like. Now what? Yeah. So it's all those little threads that we've been talking about are kind of coming together to say, yeah, we don't know, but we're gonna we're gonna reach in and and, and bring out the best of what we have to to try to meet the situation. And and often that looks like well, it, it doesn't look like doing. Mm. It looks like being. I'm feeling as well, like for me, my, my archetype um, is not nearly as, um, hasn't got quite the, the eloquence that yours has because my archetype just went, dude, chill, it'll be fine. <laughs> the surfer archetype, we need that too. And once again, the surfer, I love surfers. I think they're, they're magical because they're, they're constantly watching and reading the changes mm-hmm. and you know they're they're flowing with it and and delighting in the waves that really are synonymous with the waves of energies in our lives and the experience so i think that i think that's a great archetype dude cowabunga <laughs> i can't i'm not very good at that <laughs> But it, it's all, do, uh, dudes. Dudes also get dumped. They expect to get dumped. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they wipe out. Yeah, the- and that's part of that's part of the the package. It's not always shooting the tube and you know this and that. Sometimes you get dumped. Sometimes you're you're out there with dolphins. Sometimes the sun is setting sometimes you know the water's glassy sometimes you've got these massive waves you're facing it all and you're and you're orienting yourself around what is in the moment yeah as opposed to going oh my god no we need to organize these waves so they're more orderly (laughs) which is what we try and do (laughs) (laughs) it's true it's true (laughs) So maybe surfing is the path of maturity. Yeah, I've completely lost now because I got present with with what you were saying. I was like, yeah, I was out on a wave. <laughs> it's just like, and then I went on oh, my shoulders sore. I've got I've got rotator cuff problems. I dislocated my shoulder, and I've got massive ro- rotator cuff problems. So I'm like, yeah, couldn't paddle the surfboard out. So that was where I went with that then. <laughs> I was out on my surfboard, but wondering if I could persuade somebody to tow me out so I could just go and stand up and do that bit. Right. (laughs) Metaphorical, you know, you can just hold it that way too. In terms of feeling safe, because where I was talking uh, or where I was going with this before was we get very frightened as human beings. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. We get very frightened by things that are outside of our current experience. So say we live in a all-white Midwestern town and then somebody from India moves in, right? It's, it's very racist, but anyway. We don't, like for me, I'd be uncertain because I don't understand I don't know what I can and cannot say. I don't want to make a fool of myself because it's all about me, of course. And I don't, but I also at the same time don't want to cause them any pain. So we want things to be very, very certain. 
in order to make sure that we deal well with our worlds, because ultimately it's all about us, isn't it? We we don't want to make fools of ourselves. We want to be right, and we, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I think once again, this example that you gave is about growth, growth through our lives. That um, if we're afraid of something or something's unfamiliar, we can other put it in the other category and not connect, but. If you learn more about other people's experiences, culture, which is the beauty of traveling to to other places, is that you you begin to see the connections. Like we are all human. We may look different or come from different places, but we are more connected than disconnected. And I feel that being in particularly like a dominant culture that it's imperative to keep growing, to keep learning, to keep finding out more about other people's experiences that didn't have the same growing up that I did. Or so, so once again, it comes back to that maturing has to do with keeping learning, educating ourselves, finding it kind of expanding that sense of how, how we, how we are similar to other people. And um, one of the, um, there's a story in, in the Well of Truth that's where this woman goes to a, a teepee for the first time, like has an a, experience in a woman's group. And she's looking around at all of these women and she's realizing that even though they're all strangers to her and they have different life experiences, that they they have so much in common. And it's kind of a revelation to her that, you know, we're, we're more alike then we are different. And let's find those places and strengthen those places. A sign of maturity is when you realise that it's not about you. So what you're saying is when that your character in the book went into the TP, all of these other women having all the different experiences didn't negate anything she'd experienced. It didn't mean anything about her. And maturity is when you, you're okay being with everybody else, being who they are. Exactly. And in fact, it, it deepens you and, and it, because you're more expanded and more able to have, have them in your heart, in your sphere, in, you know, in some way. And, and, and I think that's sort of like those mycelial threads underneath the forest that are doing the connecting. So Yeah. I thought jigsaw puzzle. I saw pieces uh-huh. of jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, exactly. Same same thing. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Did we talk about what you wanted to talk about? Have we covered that? Oh, I've just been having a great old time. Yes. Yes. <gasps> yes. <laughs> it's been it's been great talking to you because like normally I'm the host and you talk, but you want a conversation, which is fabulous because the two of us are just, do you know, I've got to tell you this and I will be deleting this. I had one guest on and I wanted her to go into, she was talking about something and I wanted her to go in a particular direction. So I shared a story. She was so offended. She wouldn't answer my questions after that. And not being able to use the podcast. So it's great. So I was a little bit nervous when you were asking me for my opinion, but then I just went, get off it. I just need to have a conversation now. So, yeah. Good. Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that, but everybody has their different style or their, or what they want the outcome to be as far as how they run their podcast. But I, I, um, you know, it feels like your, your, your expertise, your experience is just as valid as mine. So, you know, there's nobody that is an expert here. It's like we're two human beings have had lots of life experience and um, we like to have a good time. And <laughs> You're as curious as me. That's, that's what I really got. You're as curious about other people as I am. And mm. that was uh, what gave me the uh, impetus, uh, permission, Hmm. to to join the conversation and really so it was like a co-hosting chat rather rather than a guest thing and I think I think being curious well not you know we talked about listening and being and holding but being curious that's how you keep growing yes (laughs) 
<laughs> you can't help it. You want to know more. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, that's what makes life interesting. And when you're curious, actually, I hadn't thought about this before, but when you're curious, there's no fear there. You forget about needing to feel safe. Right, right. It, it takes you kind of, it, it like naturally takes you out of your little zone into this place where, you, where you're merging with, with the larger world and, and marveling at it, which is pretty good. I like to live there. <laughs> like I can only ever see the world and the universe from where I'm sitting and my experiences. I can't see it from yours. And that intrigues me because I want to go shuffle around into your world and see the world through your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you do this podcast because it, that's a way of engaging and and sharing that with other people. This enthusiasm that you have that is infectious, you know, because <laughs> you get other people like, yeah, oh yeah, I want to learn about that too. So that's a huge gift that you're offering to the community. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I to me, it's the difference between my life now and what it was when I started the podcast, and I've always been curious about other people. My husband always jokes. He said, do you have tell me your life story tattooed across your forehead or anything? He said, because some random will come up to you and all of a sudden you know their entire life history. (laughs) That is definitely another one of your superpowers is that you make people feel comfortable enough and and you're open and receptive so that they feel that they can share that. I guess really a beautiful thing. I've always loved it. I I have to say it's not something I've ever railed against. Um, But And I'm astonished that it doesn't happen to other people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It just just always happened to me. Mm. Well, it's a good thing. We, the world needs that. (laughs) Fantastic. (laughs) Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's been an absolute joy again. We've had the best time. Fabulous. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted and rate and review this podcast and share it with your friends, please. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you're leaving with some great ideas that can make a difference in your everyday life. Until next time.